moment is um, in terms of what the Hear the webinar. Oh. Uh. Virtual reality of technology is has a history in the space, so let's not make that again. Um, and then hopefully at the end of this, you'll, the, the goal is to let you all know that we have some of this equipment and there are ways in which we're going to play. Um, questions to keep in mind um, as you go through the talk or as you listen to the talk and try to spin through 62 slides in an hour or 20 minutes um, are, you know, what, what came before this? How would you position this technology? Um, I know where I fit into the spectrum, but not everybody works in the same way. Um, as you go through your professional life or your personal life, how might you consume this content? How, what does this content open up to you? What is, what are the dangers? What are the, what, what might you be able to do with this, or what might you need to do to responsibly exist in a world in which this is a possibility? Um, and then also keep in mind where to, this is going to be a theme. We have this equipment. We would like people to come and try it out. So where can I, where can I try the technology out myself? Um, in some cases, it will be under the informatics banner. In other cases, it will be in like the GIS lab, or it will be you know, other places that I'll try to call. It. So that bit of overview to start with. Um, why is it that I'm giving this talk? Because web developer and VR, AR don't necessarily coexist. Um, so I'm a web developer now at the MIT Libraries. My degree was in architecture, um, graduate, undergraduate. I worked in an architecture firm for, for a brief bit. Um, going back to my schooling, my master's thesis at Ohio State was actually on the impact of uh, communications technology on the built environment. So what sort of things are going to be, what sort of building types or spatial types are going to be created, augmented, or go away completely? Bank lobby. Um, so <laughs> that was, you know, I was, I was kind of interested in this um, only in schooling. Um, some early research projects I was involved with were about how to capture buildings that were at, at, the, camp, at the campus that I worked on and how to, and it was a, we worked in a hundred some odd year old building that was going to be torn down and was awesome for all sorts of reasons, but I was very sad that it was going away, so we were trying to use the technology at the time, like QuickTime VR, Office Studio, and other technologies to try to preserve what was Ives Hall. So I've been messing around with this more than just the two years that I've been working on like, um, um, Outside of me, um, so we can now start talking about the history of this and putting the virtual reality or augmented reality in some sort of framework. Um, bonus points if you know the reference of this of this still, um, which we'll come back later. So let's talk about what the actual terms virtual reality and augmented reality are. Um, if you do the requisite Googling and look at Wikipedia or look at the Oxford English Dictionary, you'll see definitions like, I'll, I'll read the OED's ones. Um, it's relatively short. A computer-generated simulation of a lifelike environment that can be interacted with in a seemingly real or physical way by a person by means of responsive hardware such as a visor or gloves with sensors. Um, that's kind of what you see in the screen. You know, people with people wearing the headsets that you see in the Samsung commercials or Daydream or things like that. But it's not. You know, if you've seen the kind of campus tours of video games that you could pay five dollars in the mid '90s and stand and walk on a rollerball and play some crude Dungeons and Dragons game, you've seen that before. Um, going back to the 1962 Sensorama device that you would stick your head in and would actually blow fans at you and the chair would rock. Um, it's basically. I, I position VR and AR under the umbrella of human-computer interaction, um, where instead of you know the computer that is here, we're trying to make the that that screen, that rectangle of screen, take up more of your mental space. Um, so you know, put your head in a canopy, so we block out everything else. We put the you know we put the device 
you know, through the cardboard, you can, you know, right there, and it takes up even more of your space and it blocks out even more of reality. So that to, that's the big piece to me of, is of virtual reality is blocking out more and more of everything that's not mediated. Um, that stands in distinction to augmented reality, which is more than happy to let you retain awareness of everything else around you, but we um, insert things into your awareness. So in this case, you know, I guess this is Ikea or something, or, you know, but what, what, would the couch, what, what would this couch look like in that space? So I don't have to look at a picture of the catalog, I can actually walk around and go, oh yeah, that does fit, or no, I'm going to hit my knee on walking through this. Um, of course, lots of people probably know Pokemon Go, um, which is AR. I mean, that is a mediated experience that overlays on top of our experience in the real world, and certain spaces become more magical, and you find up, you end up spending 15 minutes at AOIT stop trying to catch them. And Charizard. <laughs> so, but that, I mean, that is a that is a mediated reality that is laid over your experience of the real world. To me, this is the this is the definition of augmented reality. So. And then if you're a sports fan, you know, if you watch NFL games, you know they put more on the screen now for the television broadcast than it ever exists inside the stadium. So that also augmented reality. Um, and I, unfortunately, I couldn't put the slide in. I found a slide of Australian rules football where they, at halftime, they show this like fisheye panorama of the screen with a heat map showing like where this player appeared in the first half, where this player ran in the second half and was landing. I would love that in the NFL broadcasts. Anyway, um, so let's talk about things that don't involve, you know, replacing everything entirely. You probably all remember Second Life or first-person shooters like Quake or Doom. You know, any sort of digital reconstruction of space that you can walk through that it becomes so engrossing that you lose track of everything around you, I would argue this is also virtual reality. It's not a headset, but it is an engrossing presentation of a mediated reality. It competes with or replaces your awareness of the, the world around you. Um, Going back, if you were like me, you probably played Zork. Um, I, I could play text-mediated video games for hours and ignore everything else, and this is words on a screen. Arguably, also virtual reality. Um, and then, for those of you who are playing along at home, this was Disclosure, the Michael Crichton movie. Um, the VR headset, he's like, my, um, Michael Douglas has a VR headset and a haptic glove, and he's walking around in this bed of marbles to browse a corporate intranet looking for files. <laughs> <laughs> Remember that when we talk about good and bad use of this technology. <laughs> so, um, reinforcing the argument about what, how to frame VR and AR, I took a, sn a snapshot of the Wikipedia page at the bottom of virtual, virtual reality. Virtual reality headsets, they also talk about wired gloves, they talk about, oh, all number of things. Dance pad, you know, different types of computer, oh, game, video game controllers, touch pads, haptics. This, this, when I saw this, this crystallized for me um, the impression that virtual reality is about human computer interaction. It's nothing magical, it's just a different way of interacting with, compu with a computation, computational environment. Um, and to beat the dead horse a bit more. Augmented reality, though, you know, it was it was really exciting for me when I realized that when I had a Wii, I could play bowling by actually moving my muscles in a way that was similar to, to bowling. I could play tennis by swinging a tennis racket as opposed to bashing buttons A and B. Right? I mean, that's a, it's a, it's, it's not anything about visual, it's about how you express yourself, how you move your body to interact with a mediated environment. And in, under the VR, AR space, I will argue also this counts. So, it isn't quite clear, I cast this net very broadly. Um, so, let's talk about where we are in this present moment, um, and as, again, as bonus points for playing at home, I invite you to think about all the ways that this image is problematic. Um, so let's talk about what the hardware is now for creating or for viewing content. Um, so starting off with the kind of Google Cardboard, the $15 headset, I love, by the way, the fact that Mattel revived the ViewMaster brand um, and are marketing a VR headset under ViewMaster, the, you know, 
thing to interact with, we interact with content. Um, what this does, in terms of your ability to interact with a virtual environment, this is what I, what I call head in a beach ball VR, where you put, you know, you're, you're holding a screen up against your head, you're using the phone's gyroscopes to be able to figure out, am I looking this way or am I looking that way? But there's no gross motion tracking, so if I take a step to the right, the phone doesn't know. You know, if you duck, if you move anything other than change the attitude of your head, that motion is lost. Um, and additionally, your ability to, well, it's, it's really awesome to be able to like look and replace entirely your visual frame of reference. Your eyeballs are basically the only thing that gets projected into the screen. Um, if you want to click or manipulate something, whatever you are looking at dead center in the center of your vision is the thing that you click on. And much like the Viewmaster, there is a button you have to hold up and say click, click, click. So that it's a very limited self-projection other than the replacement of your visual view. But the awesome part is it's 15 hours. So, you know, and it's the first, you know, first thing I had and I'm like, this is really kind of awesome. So for as much as I do draw a very broad umbrella over this, this is kind of fundamentally different than looking at a screen that's two to three feet away. Um, next up is Google Daydream. That is it's, it's the next iteration up. It's still a thing that you put your smartphone in and you stick it in front of your head. But the thing that is really, it's kind of hard to undersell how big a difference I find this, is that with Daydream you get a wand. So I no longer have to hold my hand up to my face and click exactly where I look. I can be looking somewhere and my eyes are tracking, you know, it's, it's like a laser pointer. It shoots a, a beam off into the internet. But it means that I don't have to very carefully like pretend that I'm, you know, my neck has been fused and I'm moving very artificially. I can be using this, and that even that one sticking one hand into the virtual space means that personally I come back to daydream content in a way that I do not come back to cardboard content. Um, I will be more than happy to stick my head in a, in a YouTube video and watch this, look at spherical content. But if I've got to keep my hand up here, I probably won't come back. I got one of these for Christmas and I continue to play some of the stupid little like Space Invaders games on this just for fun because it's that much more expressive. I, I have that much more agency in the world. Um, so then we go up to Oculus Rift, which is the thing that we don't have, but I think that is the thing that the GIS Lab bought, or the GIS Lab has. So if you really want this, go see the GIS folks. Um, the Cardboard and the Daydream, we do have those under informatics, so if you want to try it out, um, those are on offer. Um, with Oculus, you do, this is where you start to get body sensing. So with Daydream and Cardboard, I talked about, you know, if your head moves laterally, the simulation doesn't understand that. And that can be a significant impediment psychologically and physiologically. People report getting sick very easily because their inner ear reports that they're moving but their visual stimulus doesn't. So that can be, that can be sickness. Um, a colleague of mine, this is really awesome, but I need to spend 30 minutes and go sit in a patch of dandelions for a while. So, in my, in my, while I'm not as susceptible to that, I do find that the Oculus and above, where you can actually move your head around and it tracks your head motion and the visual representation reflects that motion, is much more believable. And I can stick my head in that for far longer than even a uh, daydream. So, at the cost of it's $500. So, trade-offs. Um, the next level up, um, I would argue, is the HTC Vive, which for a year and a half I was calling the HTC V, so to talk to you before, I'm sorry. Um, um, so that's what we have set up here, which is now it's, it's got two, body, two um, body trackers and it's got two different ones that now have three or four different buttons you can press and there's, you know, all manner of ways to project. So from the beginning, when we're talking about just head and beach ball, you now have your entire body. Because the V or Y, um, and I believe maybe the Oculus also can get set up in room mode. So you define a space on the floor where you can move wherever. Um, and you know, you won't walk into walls because the system is, if you set it up in room mode as you approach the edge of the safe space, you see a grid showing up on the screen like, don't, don't walk there. <laughs> and if you look closely on 
One of these headset, one of these handsets here yeah, has scar markings on it from playing Minecraft and like, oh, that's a brick wall. <laughs> <laughs> Worse than the game doesn't quite so work. Um, so that's that's the vibe. At this point, like I said, your whole body is projected into the space and you have a much more enriched experience. Um, beyond that, there's a couple things that are coming out. We have this is a was this, was this a Kickstarter, Micah, or is this just an early release product? Uh, early release. Okay. So this is so this is this is a faux VR. Um, it is basically a replacement headset, um, or at least if I if I understand what they intend it to be, it is a replacement headset that headset that involves eye tracking. So now instead of just presenting all data to every part of your eye, there are there are cameras inside the headset that try to figure out where you're looking. So your gaze is now a means of interacting with the with content. And I believe you can actually trigger actions based on where you look. Um, so one of the one of the advantages is it is optimizes computation because the things that are on your peripheral vision it, it doesn't have to show you that many pixels. So it can do more, it can spend more computation showing where you are looking and less computation looking where you're not looking. Um, but I believe there is also some degree of interaction capability. I don't know if like you blink at the thing or you know lock your eyes on something and it says, oh, you looked at that for a second, that counts as a click. I'm hesitant because my personal experience with this is that it is a $600 message piece of hardware for generating error messages. <laughs> Hopefully soonish, I'll be able to speak more authoritatively because I think I think there's some potential there, but I can't honestly say I've gotten it to work. Um, I've, I've seen the basic star field and looked around, but every time I try to track, like initialize the eye tracking, it shows a dot and you have to follow it on the screen and it, like the third jump, it fails on me. So, I don't know. Um, so then, the next step, next step up in hardware is the HoloLens, um, which I believe is now being sold. Yeah. So um, I'm, I'm blanking on your name. Alan. Alan. Alan has one. Um, you'll hear more about Alan here in a little bit. But um, HoloLens has a $3,000 developers kit that's available. I don't know if they're pers are, they, are they commercially available now? Yes. Okay. So they are. Um, but this is now AR. Um, everything up until this point with one asterisk, it has been virtual reality where you, the thing that you put in front of your face blocks out your awareness of the world around you entirely. With the HoloLens, it's much more, there is no opaque surface in front of you. There is a, a piece of glass that, uh, upon which things are projected that augment your experience of the real world. So you're back in reality. You don't need to, so when you're content offering, you don't need to create everything the person is seeing. You just need to create the bits that you care about and let them experience the rest of the real world everywhere else. So, but yeah, $3,000 instead of $15 like Google Cardboard. Um, so that's the viewing side of things. So let's talk about how you create stuff to view, I guess. Will you be offended if we start trying to... No, eat. Because it's here. Yeah. yeah. Um, there was sincere apologies from the woman who was the uh, catering company. She got in a car accident on the way here. Oh, okay. The driver had to come get the food and bring it, and he apologized over and over. And I said, "That's cool. Is, is she okay?" okay? Yeah, she, yeah. Okay. No, she is apparently fine. She's <laughs> very not fine. So that is why it was. <laughs> That's kind of okay. It was inside their hard-sided thing. Yeah, so, so by all means, Matt will keep talking, but please eat the food. So that said, um, let's talk about ways in which you can create content that would then be viewed in some of this equipment. Um, so the simplest kind of content that be can be created. You remember when we talked about Google Cards that head in the beach ball? The simplest kind of content is to paint the inside of the beach ball. So that's where the photospheres come in play. Um, which are relatively easily supported. Um, that did not go. There we go. Um, these photospheres are, you probably have seen them in Facebook. Um, thanks to my friend Bill Rand for Vice TV. Um, so this, it really is just that simple. Um, there's a couple different ways to, to author this, um, but this is effectively what you're doing. Um, and if you're looking at this kind of content in a VR headset, it uses the attitude tracker to be able to, you know, so you're not clicking and dragging, you're just looking looking around to see everything that was visible at that point in space. <coughs> so, yeah, photospheres. Um, 
the next kind of content is kind of photograph, you know, virtual reconstructions of environments. Um, in this case, this is the Hayden Library Courtyard that I reconstructed based on photo digital photographs. Um, so the, the basic process was take my digital camera around the Hayden Library Courtyard, around the perimeter, picture, take a step, picture, take a step, picture. That generated about 40 or 50 images that were just wherever I happen to take a picture. Feed that into a program called Autodesk Remake. There are a number of different ones that do this. I forget what the GIS lab uses. Oh. What? Photo scan. A better version of, of Remake. But it will do some sort of black magic with math and generate a 3D model of what it is that we think can photograph. Um, which is generally realistic. Um, it does try to take the sky and make that into a blue wall at the top upper edge of whatever building you photograph. But you know, the thing that I was most interested in was the Lipschitz sculpture at the at the center, and that I would wager is is very accurate to the actual 3D space. <coughs> so camera-based 3D scanning can then be used ported through a 3D model range and loaded in into um, the VR space. You can also generate 3D content via um, relatively low cost equipment like a like a sense scanner. Um, everybody say hi to my son. So you can generate 3D, any, any, the point is I guess any existing mechanism for creating 3D content can then be ported into a, and interacted with in virtual terms. <coughs> Which is um, more relevant when it comes to things that are higher up the scale than a cardboard, because again, you know, the cardboard, your head's in a beach ball, so rich 3D content isn't going to be as easy to interact with. So, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so these types of content are the things that I'm going to talk about hardware to author, uh, photospheres, photogrammetric scanning, and then actual 3D scanning. Thank you. You're welcome. So let's talk about hardware. Um, the simplest one is what Kelly's showing up is the Ricoh Theta. Um, this is eff effectively twin fisheye lenses. On a th it's a $300 product um, that has one fisheye lens facing this way, another fisheye lens facing that way um, by this austerity too. Um, at, when you press the button on this or hit the button on your smartphone, it will capture everything visible from that space and algorithmically stitch those two fisheye images into a seamless photosphere. So it is instantaneous. Um, it is dead simple to use. Um, it also has the capability of capturing video, and I am told it is possible to stream live on YouTube. Um, I managed to do it for about three seconds in my queue. Um, but then decided no one wanted to watch me write code. So, uh, um, although apparently I did have intellectual property story, I had a, a song playing in another tab, and I got an email back from YouTube saying um, so and so has laid an IP claim on your three-second snippet because you were listening to I don't know Katy Perry or something. I don't know. I, I triggered some automatic system. I don't know. So. Anyway, so that's the Ricoh Theta. Um, the next step up is this little uh, camera, camera robot here. Um, this is the Views. Um, it is, instead of two fisheye lenses, it is now four pairs of lenses. So it's a stereoscopic 3D. Um, you can export it as, as monocular spherical or you know, left and right eye spherical. Um, having played around with it, that really does make a difference. Um, the, and YouTube natively supports this format. Um, so when we record, when we dump this up to YouTube, we'll put it up in both channels. So if you get a chance to see this in uh, in a headset, you'll see what the difference is. <coughs> it seems to be particularly relevant for things that are relatively close to the camera. I mean, at, at, at far distances, binocular and single channel video doesn't seem to make much difference. But that short to medium range, it really does, it, it, for me anyway, increase kind of spatial comprehension of, yeah, there's a thing right there versus I'm looking at the painting on the inside of a beach ball. So those are the two cameras that we've got. Um, the, the scanner that I showed was the Sense. Um, it's a combination time of flight scanner and a white light uh, camera, a visible light camera for capturing textures. Um, if you get into generating 3D models to put into an authoring environment, that's a good way to do that. 
Um, the authoring environments, um, the one that I see in the placards before a lot of VR content is the Unity game engine authoring platform. Um, very, very popular. I have not used it myself, but it seems to be effectively the standard for that. Um, so, yeah. My, ex my explorations of this terrain have not yet reached that waypoint. Um, but that's when I get to that point of creating richer content, that's where I'm headed. Um, so, yeah, we're about 30 minutes in. Okay. Slide 36 or 62 if you're counting along at home. So, now that we've talked about, you know, what's the state of the hardware, what's the state of the software currently, let's talk about what you might be able to do with this. Because up, up until this point, we've talked, we've shown what's possible, but we haven't really given any sort of direction other than passing aside about maybe not using VR to browse your corporate internet file structure. Um, so, the background for this, I'm going to assume that at MIT I don't need to introduce the Mars Curiosity rover. But I will say that if you interact, if you, there's an app under the, v, under the Vive ecosystem where a third party, I don't know who, downloaded every image the Curiosity rover took over the period of like six weeks to when it was stopped at a specific site on the Martian surface, used all those images in, in, to photogrammetrically reconstruct an accurate model of the surface of Mars. And so you can wander around in the surface of Mars and the space geek in me loves that. I think I probably spent 30 minutes walking around looking at rocks. I don't like rocks, but they're on Mars. So, so anyway, um, to start with, my starting point for discussions of what's appropriate or what's not appropriate or what might be a good idea. Um, Jeremy Balenson is a professor at Stanford. Um, he wrote an article in Slate, or he was interviewed for an article in Slate, maybe in the last year or so, talking about the kind of hype curve on VR and saying everybody wants to do everything in VR, but our research going back years indicates these kind of four principles for what might be good VR content. I'm not going to take his arguments as gospel truth, but I do think they provide a framework to help help us can make our own judgments. So the four things that he's identified as being good candidates are things that are expensive. Um, so, you know, not everybody has the time to go to every art museum in the world and travel and see all the great masters paintings in all the places. So if it's, if it's prohibitively expensive to witness, maybe a good candidate in VR. Dangerous? Yeah. Swimming with great white sharks, touring the radioactive chambers at Chernobyl, probably not something to put your body through, but if you could experience that virtually, maybe helpful. Um, impossible, think about scale changes. You know, what is life like at, at very small scales or very big scales or things that you just physically cannot do, and then things that are time-based but extraordinarily rare. So the volcano eruption that happens once a century, if we can capture that virtually, more people can witness it than we're actually there, there physically. Um, so with those four ideas in mind, um, I'm going to talk about some content that I've seen in the wild, um, starting with the Facebook that my friend posted. My friend posted. Um, you know, think about the expense of travel, if there's something specific you want to go to, or if you are going and you want to share a more, uh, more engaging experience back to friends of yours who couldn't travel. Things like photospheres that you take on an Android phone or via Theta might be one way to present more interactively or more engagingly what it's like at that place in space. Um, so, and some of this, you know, a lot of places, a lot of commercial platforms already support this kind of content. So that's where I showed the tour of, yeah, Facebook does photospheres. You don't need to import them, export them as a special file. You upload it and it, their servers recognize it as a, a photo a photosphere and will make it available in a, in a context that makes sense. Um, Flickr also does the same thing, so this is Walton Pond. Um, and the nice thing about this is also uh, Google Maps supports this automatically. So um, I've been doing this on every trip I've basically taken over the last two years, and some of them is kind of scary how many times people have looked at some of these. Um, <laughs> the Pier the Great Lakes Science Center on Lake Erie in Cleveland has been 240,000 times. Um, more people than will fit on the pier. So um, that was kind of interesting. Um, 
You can also do uh, uh, YouTube videos this way. Um, if you search for 360 videos, this one is this one is kind of cool. Um, they took what appears to be a theta, hung it underneath a weather balloon, and let go. So and there's you know so. YouTube does support the 3D, con the 360 content, so I can drag drag this video around. Um, it's not the live, it's not the raw feed because it takes more than five minutes to get up to the place where they went. But you know, if you want to see what your hometown looks like at a reasonable height that's beyond what you can stand, imagine doing this from the bottom of a kite. There's a whole field of kite photography where this kind of thing happens. Do that in VR, and now I can see more comprehensively what my neighborhood looks like. Or you know, we start to talk about things that are dangerous. So 113,000 feet up, uh, 34,000 feet up, we're getting above the clouds, and it is now 7 degrees below zero. Um, so yeah, I think I think they finally got. I think the balloon that they're under. Yeah, there's the balloon. Um, I think the balloon finally popped at about 140,000 feet up. Um, I don't know how high Baumgartner went when he did the Red Bull jump, but I would bet that it's pretty close. So, you know, think think back to all those arguments about really expensive to do with your body, really dangerous to do with your body, but we can see what this is like now. So. I would argue it's, re it's at least worth trying and figuring out what other mistakes are you can make and what other ways to do this well or not so well so we can work on perfect on improving this kind of content. Um, and yeah, so that was my tour through what the, cur the kind of current state of content is. Um, there's also, the, there are <coughs> museums creating content around this. Um, there's this is a this is a good and bad example. Um, the v VR Museum of Fine Art is an app you can get under the HTC Vive um, application uh, that allows you to move through a virtual art museum and interact with pieces of art that have been, that have been photographed at high, at high resolution. And there is the usual accoutrements of a museum. So there's placards, and there's voice tours, and there's it's a for being a completely fake museum. Um, it, can build collections from disparate physical places. It's really interesting. Um, the, 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 honestly, the biggest piece of this that really viscerally struck me was when you first boot this up, you're in an outer lobby and you have to pass through a metal detector. <laughs> <laughs> Why that piece of museum going experience is, was deemed necessary to replicate. <laughs> yeah. So but you know the, the 3D scan, you know the, the David Museum there was a high res 3D scan that was done with a laser scanner. That's <coughs> you know you can build collections and you can construct cultural lessons across the holdings of multiple institutions. So you know and this is where I talk about the Smithsonian Institution has a very robust 3D scanning program. So they are holding lots of physical artifacts that they are producing 3D scans of as many of them as they can possibly make. Um, I don't think they have a brief to do everything in their holdings, but they are certainly shipping 3D models faster than I can keep up with. So we as a cultural institution who also have holdings could be playing along with this, I think, maybe. Um, so yeah, we talked about things that are dangerous, like going to the edge of space. Maybe also swimming with sharks could follow under, under the category of stuff that some people like to do, but is probably dangerous. Um, or this is this is the thing that I think I lost an afternoon to. So sorry, people. Um, Google Earth is now available under the under the Vive system, um, and it is it probably is also available under the uh, Oculus Rift, but it's in the Steam store, which is the front end to getting into the Vive. Um, the Google Earth experience is in two modes. So one is marble in front of you that you you can use both hands to kind of zoom into and inspect from a disembodied above down to maybe like it's sub sub mile altitude so you can get really in close. Um, but then you can also go into Godzilla Godzilla mode and you stand on the surface and you can move around the surface of the planet in VR. Um, so when I found this, a Kelly will attest, I had a smile etched on my face pra practically permanently. Um, but I spent probably an hour trying to recreate every vacation I ever took, trying to figure out like, oh, can I find this place in Paris? Can I do this thing in Montana? Can I find that place in Italy? Um, there's, 
and, and I tried to break it because uh, um, they don't do internal spaces so much. Um, so you can stand on top of things. The scanners, I mean, the 3D model that they're generating does have underhangs, but like I couldn't walk under the Grand Arc de la, de la Defense in Paris, but I could go right up next to it and then using the body tracking stick my head under it. And now I'm under the thing or stick my head inside Notre Dame in Paris <laughs> and see like, the, you know, the, the illusion falls apart because they haven't modeled the inside, but it was engaging enough that it, and I was viscerally present in the simulation enough that yeah, I was. I tried to stick my head in Notre Dame. Um, I was out here at Kendall, and I think you could, the smallest you can go is about 12 stories. But at that point, your head is under the tower of the Marriott Hotel. Um, so you are physically. I mean, it, it really is a visceral experience of I am in this space. So if you're looking for a way to kill time, <laughs> step one. <laughs> so um, yeah. So, and then we talk about rare. So, the National Geographic has been doing a re relatively good job of taking 360 video content in isolated places or rare events around the globe. So, they flew, but they arranged for a helicopter to fly over a volcano, volcanic eruption in the middle of Siberia, um, which I'm not going to go to, but it was kind of cool to stick my head and imagine flying outside a helicopter through this weather and see that kind of experience. Um, so that's all the kind of viewing. Or they did, so far a lot of this has been viewing um, and not so much like we do things. It's a lot of looking at. Um, so we can talk about things that you can do. Um, and in this space we're talking, we start talking about a lot of games. Um, so the lab is one that is very similar to it, it was similar in my sense in my experience to the first moments when you play Wii Sports and you have the experience of oh I'm playing a game doing the thing that I'm playing and not just matching A and B. So this is a this is a it's a marketing shop but it conveys the experience. You're standing on a, on a castle rampart shooting arrows at uh, invaders and the mechanism of doing that is grab a bow pull back let go, pull back, let go. It's a having shot archery, not in hitting forms, but it feels a lot like shooting an arrow. Um, and, it's, and it's a realistic enough experience that <coughs> when the simulation breaks down and like the hand tracking fails, it's jarring. He's like, Wait, where'd the bow go? Like, I had a bow in my hand, where did it go? Like, why, why did the aim go wrong? Like, it, it's, it hits that, if you're, if you're familiar with the concept of the, of the uncanny valley, um, you're through the trough and you're climbing back up again. You're not all the way up at the full engagement, so you're still at risk of falling back, but it's realistic enough that it is physically jarring when it fails, if that, if that distinction makes any sense. Um, you can also do things like uh, games like Fantastic Contraption where you can build go-karts or things that move a certain distance and can you fit through a thing and send your goal over the box. Funds, you know, highly speculative, but you know, th at this point that you're very much in, in a completely alter artificial experience, but it is what it is. Um, seeing the time and I'm going to have to speed up. So, um, yes, someone has ported Minecraft into the VR. Um, the only time I've ever been ex actually afraid of a creeper um, is when you turn around and it's right there. Um, so that's the gaming side of things. There's also the, we talked a little bit. I talked a little bit about filmmaking, about make, creating video content. There is a filmmaking ecosystem that is springing up. So people filming various experiences, um, including um, thank you to Helen for putting this one to me. I think uh, film lover, which was it's it's not photorealistic at all, but it was it's a, an art presentation based on the biometric recordings of someone when they first looked at a photograph of their spouse. Um, so you, you get, I mean, it's like lines moving in space, but it's an exploration of what your body goes through in that moment of extreme emotion. Um, and it was really kind of interesting. Um, so it's not, the thing that this, this means to me is that people are finding ways to present and tell stories using the ordinances of this. Um, of course, we also have to talk about sports. Um, and the NFL, the NBA, a couple other places have done, have started to experiment with broadcasting, broadcasting things. 
There is, in fact, a social network for VR. Um, I have signed up, but I have no friends yet, so I don't really understand what this is. <laughs> so, um, we're, we're super, I'm curious, um, when I posted about you know, joining this V-Time on Facebook, a friend of mine said, well, are we going to recreate up now, or are we just going to like all sit in our little chairs? So there might be some resistance to this in some quarters. Um, so anyway, that's the kind of directions that we see and some principles that might organize things that might be good or might be bad. Um, so let's talk about things that I've seen that please let us do better than this. Um, so we talked about Second Life. Second Life is tree and education is awful. Um, the fact that we're going to recreate a classroom that is more student hostile than the average classroom. Why are we making benches like this? Why are we teaching language on recreating a slideshow in virtual reality? No. If what you're trying to do looks like that, stop, please. Um, so, yeah. Um, <laughs> so, non-consensual experiences, leaving yourself exposed to other people looking at you, beautiful scenery, real world, and we don't know what, like, I'm not sure what she's looking at, but I'm willing to bet it's not more beautiful than whatever that is out of focus. So, I... Creepy. Yeah. <laughs> Um, the, having taken colleagues through this, it really it was awkward for me to stand there while someone else is doing it. I don't, I don't want them thinking I'm staring at them while they're experiencing this this very solo and very visceral experience. So the fact that this is marketing copy for a company triggers all sorts of concern on my part. Um, what? <laughs> this is a real video by a company called Looker. Um, I am praying. It's so over the top. I'm, it has to be a joke. But they recreated a virtual environment for stacked bar charts in VR. <laughs> I invite you to watch, and I hope you. So I hope I'm right in viewing this as a joke because if they're serious, they completely just <laughs> everything. Um, so, yeah, surely we can do better than this. Um, so, in the time we've got available, I do, I do want to get some of your thoughts. Um, thoughts on or projects that I've seen in the library space, so library and affiliated domains. Um, so this is Lore Books. Um, Alan. Um, I met Alan at the ha Codex Hackathon that was at the Media Lab in 2017. Helen was at the Codex Hackathon in 2016. This is a uh, AR application for interacting with and augmenting book reading experiences. Um, so if you're interested, I will be le a less effective spokesman than Alan will, so I would I invite you to meet him. Um, I'm glad you're here. Um, so, you know, what would it? What might it be possible to take a book reading experience and use that as an overlay onto the real world? Um, this is a lot clearer than that picture. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 this is like I think this is the first video that they shared on Facebook. So it was a very very early demo. Um, so uh, the other another project that came out of the Codex Hackathon was one that Helen worked on, uh, Lit City. Um, the idea being. It is, my argument of it would be similar to Pokemon Go of let's use your travels through the real world to, tri to make you aware of literary locations around a space. So as you walk through France, point out, oh, this is the cafe where so-and-so wrote. This is the scene, this is the two windmills from, the, from Moulin Rouge. This is the this thing. If there's any, you know, if we can leverage artificial or augmented reality to make you aware of, a his, of the hidden histories of a place, this seems like it would be a decent opportunity for that. Um, for, my, for my own story, I had a moment like this actually playing Pokemon Go. Um, a couple months ago, I was wandering around and I saw a stop on campus that I had never hit before. And I walked, wandered over and I, you know, you click on it to blow it up and you see a little uh, 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 enlarged image, which was an image that I recognized. It was an image of a Challenger astronaut. It was Ronald McNair. So I wandered in like, oh, I, this is a real thing. I need to find this. 
found a plaque in a lobby that I would have never met, never seen otherwise, dedicated to the memory of Ronald McNair, plaque next to it talking about the Blacks at MIT History Project, which the library is already involved with. And I had a moment of increased of understanding more about the history of my own institution and understanding a relevance to my life that it, I was completely unaware of. I didn't know Ronald McNair had a connection to MIT. I was heartbroken when Challenger blow, blew up. So that sort of tie-in, if I think we can do more of, we can we can have a positive impact on the people who use this kind of technology. Um, Story Map was another application that came out of um, this year's Codex Hackathon, trying to um, put together walking routes th that will like tailor audio maps. So if I'm listening to a story that the characters are doing this thing and then doing that thing, if we know you're going to be listening to that, and we can plot a route so that as the characters in the story are going underneath the sketchy bridge, you are walking underneath the sketchy bridge, <laughs> we might be able to leverage your real world experience with the uh, mediated presentation that you're listening to, was the attempt there. Um, or the, those of us who are trying to gener you know, capture or understand what the people around us are already doing. You, if you've walked through the tunnels, you know the, the, paint, the art project in the one tunnel. There are AR uh, components to that. I love the you are human and I am not a robot. Um, so, you know, the people around us are generating this content. Um, getting super specific to libraries, if we're going to be charged with preserving this, how does that work? You know, how do we put this in D space? How do we like? How do we capture this? How do we preserve that? I guess specifically with this one, there's, they have all of their murals online on a website where you can use the app and just point at your computer and it does the same thing. Yeah. But, yeah. What? I think some of the students when Bexley was going to be demolished, they they document. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean there will be web presences for this. There will be, you know, various artifacts created. But as a specifically augmented reality artifact, how do we preserve this? Um, so the other thing, this is this is Madeline. Um, Madeline and the GIS lab are working with GIS and uh, applications of virtual reality. I know Daniel Sheehan has learned how to find a drone, and he's. Take, taken the photographs and done photographic reconstruction of mountain ranges in the American West, which the students in the class are going to be working with. So there are attempts to put toeholds into this space, um, but yeah, this is this is slide 61 of 62. So <laughs> with 20 with two minutes left, um, these were the goals that I set out at the beginning of what. I hoped would come out of this. Um, this is the, the email address to contact for more information, the URL for, um, and this, this will also all go up on the informatics website, which is that informatics.mit.edu. So the slides will be available provided as soon as I make sure that I didn't do anything not worth sharing on this. But um, I'm hoping that as a result of all this, we've talked about how I at least position VR and AR in the kind of technology space and why I put it under a human com under the human computer interaction umbrella. Um, talked a little bit about what hardware we have at MIT or exists in the market for creation of content, for viewing of content, um, and talked a little bit about what might make a piece of content more or less suitable as fodder for some sort of experience like this. Um, my last thought on this is, I realized this as I was putting together the, the, the library space slides, a lot of these, and I'm not sure what, I'm not sure if this is meaningful or not, a lot of, actually all of them are in augmented reality, not in virtual reality. There are they're pieces of content that don't try to create from whole cloth a digital experience. There are things that augment what we do already. What, we read books, we exist in places, we take walks. So do we have anything to help people's experiences of the real world? Maybe I just don't know the VR side of things in the library <coughs> space, but this was something that I, it, it occurred to me like, all my examples are AR. I don't know why, I don't know if that's meaningful or not. So anyway, yeah, that's all I got. Two minutes. Two minutes. All right. Yes. Um, so I've taken photos here with various degrees of success.
success. Um, the thing I wish I could also do that uh, doesn't seem to be available yet without expensive hardware is you know, just walk around an outdoor sculpture and take a outside looking in panorama of it rather than yeah. an inside looking at that's where photogrammetry that's where photogrammetry comes in. Um, I've, I've done that exact thing, that that, Baylor, that Lipschitz sculpture in the Hayden Courtyard. Mm -hmm. I've done that, you know, walk around and do look in. Um, software programs like Remake, um, I believe if you have an, M an MIT affiliation, you get a free license for it, or at least a free trial of it. Um, I would really recommend trying out Remake. Um, there was another product from Autodesk, which they unfortunately killed, called 123D Catch, that was awesome for that. Um, it's remains to be seen how well Remake is going to be as a replacement. But yes, that would be my recommendation for that type, that kind of content. Thank you. Uh, regarding the 360 video, do you think that was put together with a combination of photospheres or by a separate video recording technology? Um, all the all the photos, all the 360 videos that I've seen have been with the same hardware. Um, these these kinds of equipment are capable of filming video at 30 frames a second as well as individual frames. Um, so yeah, the, the video use case does not require multiple multiple photographs that are then stitched. You can generate it as video natively. Your thank you, thank goodness. Uh, this was the Rico Theta. R I C O H uh, data like the letter. Um, that I, if I'm recommending a purchase, that's probably where I'd start. And then find a way that that doesn't work for you before you buy something. But look at that first. Great, Max. Um, we actually have a project starting with the Obama and Obama conservation strategies for summer tourism. And the new industry facility, and they are actually looking at it. So it's not going to be one strategy, it's a complex yeah. set of strategies. Yeah, and I think every, every, every institution is going to chart their own course based on their holdings or their various interests, but I'm glad to hear that we have a, we're putting a foot in that space as well. So. A toe. We'll call it a toe. Yeah. <laughs> a, toe. A, a toe is better than a toe. So. The presentation of what content specifically? And, uh, well, one of the examples of the documentary, dope documentary thing, so it's, uh, it's called High Rise. Um, and it's a, it's a long, it's a longitudinal set of content for um, an urban environment. Okay. So I have a question specifically. Um, I know if I, if I heard you correctly at the beginning, you were you came in as very familiar with the set of content, and I want to make sure that you learned something out of this. Not to put okay. you on the spot, but mm -hmm. is this good? Yeah, this is fine. I'm going to go ahead and unmute folks on the phone in case okay. they have questions. Sure. Yes. Just an FYI, Boston has a very active virtual reality meetup group, as well as a less active AR meetup. There is an AR meetup tonight, it's just across the street in Boston. Uh, across the street at? Like, uh, oh, at the Nerd Center? Also, I want to add uh, one of my friends who used to be in the camera culture group in the Media Lab, the company, he's the VP of, I don't know what his title is, but they're, they have a competing product that's called Meta. Meta? M-E-T-A. Is that a, like a headset it's kind a, of thing? An AR headset. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, will, I will look them up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Um, this isn't necessarily a question, but just a, I don't know, suggestion somehow. So there's, there's so many different groups around MIT that are doing things with VR, AR, mixed reality, and there's only going to be more and more. It would be great if somehow there was a way to bring people together or, you know, learn from what each other are doing. I've, I've already seen a number of groups sort of start from scratch thinking about, okay, well, what's this use, useful for and what's pointless to do in it? And, you know, within MIT there's going to be so many great innovative ideas of what is cool to do in, in yeah. Different kinds of reality. I don't know how exactly we could like keep track of what what different groups are doing with it, but I think I mean I, th I think there are opportunities for cross cutting uh, communities. Um, I know I think Project Manus might be an opportunity, like the the makerspace mm -hmm. piece. Um, there was an effort here. On 
The number of effort here at the library is uh, on the label of student digital makers to kind of interview ethnographically students who were creating digital assets. Um, I don't know that any of those was a VR, although I think, I want to say there was at least one VR project that we discovered through that as a way of trying to position the libraries for what might we be able to support. That report, I think yesterday was sent up to library leadership. Um, and, but I think, I think you're absolutely right to point to want a community for people to speak and find each other. It, for me, it remains to be seen whether or not that needs to be step one. Um, because I, th I do think that there is, I find that in um, doing a lot, at least some portion of early learning myself, to help build up a mental framework before I adopt somebody else's worldview. But uh, even a community to help find a yeah. structure those early investigations. Okay. I know there's already a lot of a lot of VR projects going on around MIT. Yeah. So um, we don't all know each other, about each other. I, I, which is typical. I think uh, I would hope that some talk like this and sending a word out can help yeah. people meet each other. So. Uh, yeah, so I just have a VR library question. Um, one of the. Oh, could I continue on the topic? Oh, yeah. yeah. Just a meta observation. This vulcanization is an accelerator in MIT. It would be neat if it occurs in science education research, in video production, and now in VR. It would be neat if the library could systematically address this issue. And that, yeah, I guess that ties into the. By question, which is that one of the purposes of the modern purposes of the library is to allow a platform that people who are low income or don't have access to newer technology to actually go in and get access to it. You know, people go to the library now to use computers to you know, you know, get citizenship. Should libraries uh, obtain VR equipment? to allow, to help its mainstream adoption. Is that the responsibility of public libraries? So that's a fascinating question. Um, and it's one that I, I grappled with that question two years ago, doing mucking around with 3D printing. Um, and because I gave the last one of these that I gave was on rapid, rapid prototyping 3D fabrication and 3D scanning. Um, and it, I, it felt really weird. Um, Imagining the MIT library trying to position itself as the means to introduce technology to MIT that was invented at MIT. <laughs> um, I mean, quite, quite literally, some of, the, some of the 3D printing processes were invented at MIT, and it just felt incredibly presumptuous for, if, for, for me to try to argue that we should get this in the hands of everybody. But I think your point is well made because while there are places at MIT that create this content, that invent this technology. It's not evenly distributed. Not everybody will have access to it. And I think there can be a, a role for the libraries to play to say, if you're interested in this, if you're not in a space where you have access to it or in some other way, come to the libraries and we'll help. We'll, we'll be a, a point of access for the technology. We'll be a point of access for thinking to help frame it responsibly using the ethics of librarianship. Um, I think I think there's a role to play there, but I think we have to, for us as the MIT libraries, we have to navigate waters that a public library in Kansas might not have to navigate. Um, but I'm I'm glad to hear you make that observation because I I tried to figure out how. The, Present, you know, haven't come up with a good way to do it yet. Can I just respond? Yeah. When I wrote um, our proposal for getting uh, VR equipment to the chair club, it was with the idea that maybe someday you could check out VR headsets, and, the, and also we also had a proposal for drums, and someday you could check out drums. So we're kind of navigating what qualifications for drums that someone needs to be licensed, <laughs> protect the name, comply very carefully, but with VR, it's going to be a little easier. So yeah, it's probably a great spot because we actually have a bunch of the 3D modeling software already used in the architecture library. Um, and so it was pretty easy. It was just the headset and the wrapping part that we could equip a whole lab pretty quick for people to use it. Also, uh, it, it occurred to me just now, uh, Ferrara, the VR AR Association, what they're doing is they're actually creating a database of all the companies in VR and AR. So I was going to comment that um, the library not, not necessarily 
need to provide the resource itself, it could be a good first stop for you know, referring to people to where the resource is available. Yeah. And that, you know, we, we, we did, so, Mike and I did that with uh, 3D Printer where we went around and interviewed various places on campus <coughs> with the goal of understanding the landscape of the institute and then to be able to figure out how to share awareness of that network. So <coughs> I, I could imagine something similar, a similar kind of listening tour and integration probably at a URL like that. Say, you know, if you are active in this space, we want to talk to you, we want to understand what you're doing, and then be able to share that back to the MIT community. So to help shortcut some of this or you know, act as a bridge or a commons for people to be able to do it. Yeah, and I think the library is hard to keep up today. It would be. <laughs> but the library is maybe in a unique, you know, like, like what other people said, maybe in a unique position to make some of these connections and act as a, a resource connector because Yes, some, a lot of these technologies came from MIT, and of course there are, you know, experts in MIT, but their labs, despite MIT being quite open theoretically, their labs are closed, you know, they're, they're closed, they're private labs, and yeah. I didn't even know about, about the GIS lab, and I know, I mean, there's tons of VR and AR stuff at the media lab, but they're not particularly, Yeah, you know, they're using it all. They're not, yeah, they're, they're, they, they're fighting them up for it among themselves, it's, they it's not that easy for them to share it. So, but the library, everybody knows where the library is. And everybody knows what kinds of things you can do there. So, it might be a good And it makes a talk on how to do the workflow of taking GIS data into 3D modeling software and then visualizing the VR. So, I have a workshop for that Great. in the fall. Right. So it's kind of, it's like that one niche. One specific that's very process. Much what I'm doing with the right, VR, right. VR flow, but. Yeah. That's, a, that's a good example of the, where, where libraries could choose to step in. If the research resources and and it was available in similar to kind of the 3D and the rapid fabrication model. Even if the space is there, for most most people finding the space and equipment is not is not the challenge. So first you have to understand that your problem that some aspects of your problem may be solved by by some aspects of VR or in our case or something, and then have a, you know, have some steps for decomposing the problem, figuring out what pieces of it, right. modeling it, and only only at the end is going and doing it as part of the problem. So this is sort of a library reference problem, but in a different way. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. You go from the problem to the particular set of solutions. Yeah. And I would say that Matt and Kelly were wonderful when I was starting out because they had all this equipment, and so I got to come in and pick your brain about what should I buy for, the, for what we're, we want to do. So it was so wonderful having all these to look at and, and use even before um, branching out. Uh, I will say Madeline has proof that if you come in and want to talk to us, we will talk to you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they can bring you play with the toys if you want. Yeah. So if you want to come play with the toys there, yes. you, can, you can sign up. Um, and thanks again to Matt. <laughs>